Hello viewers, welcome to some one vs. one commander gameplay. My name is Little Beep. I like to play rogue commander decks when I get the chance. And my favorite of late has been Moran of Clan Nel Toth, a Golgari commander that's very popular in the paper dual commander format, which has a slightly different ban list and whatnot, but not so popular online tends to be overshadowed as a card advantage engine by cards like Brea and Leobold. And I think that's a darn shame because even though Moran does only have access to two colors and it's four mana, it might seem a little slow, it just gets to do some really broken things that the format is not ready for because there's very little graveyard removal. Moran kind of attacks from an unexpected angle. So let me show off the deck here real quick. Moran is a green-black rock deck, so it generally plays the quality mana creatures and discard spells and removal and other things you'd expect from any good 1v1 commander deck, but we also get some real spice that is enabled by Moran's ability. So let me show off Moran for a second here. So she lets you bring creatures back to your hand from the graveyard once per turn, or to the battlefield if you have enough experience counters, and you get experience counters whenever something dies under your control. And that's tokens too, so Moran tends to... you got experience counters really fast if she sticks around on the board. So the cards here that are a little more unusual, you wouldn't see as often, we've got Devoted Druid, extremely powerful card for this deck because it can add mana to put Moran down and then it can die whenever you want to because you can just throw minus one, minus one counters on it at any point. We've got Seder Wayfinder, a little underpowered maybe, but it hits land drops for you. It's like an Elvish Visionary that also fills your graveyard, uh, makes it easier for you to have more selection with Moran later on. We've got Smuggler's Copter, uh, really... Underplayed card in this format, I think, but it's very good at just, again, putting stuff in your yard, uh, giving you card selection, because you're kind of a toolbox deck. You have a lot of cards that are very good in specific matchups, and it helps you dig through to those. We've got, uh, in the three-drop slot, Minister of Pain to kill tokens and mana dorks and things like that. Very good against Markov, easy to tutor up. Bane Whip Punisher, uh, like a four-mana destroy target creature that also recurs itself with Moren. It's pretty useful to have around. It can kill just about anything. I was trying Vengeful Rebel in this slot before from uh, Aether Revolt, but it was pretty hard to get Revolt in this deck on a regular enough basis. We've got Merciless Executioner, which kills itself, gives Moran an experience counter, and just kind of turns into a sacrifice engine against opponents. Very, very good against decks like Leovold, where you don't want to be targeting their creatures. We've got Magic Origins Liliana, the Flip Liliana which flips when something dies, very easy to do in this deck, and then she just turns into the good Liliana, Liliana the Veil, the one I can't afford. We've got Fecundity. Whenever a creature dies, the creature's controller may draw a card. It's symmetrical, but with Moran in play, it's really not very symmetrical. We've got some excellent tutors in this deck, Eldritch Evolution, which can sacrifice Moran to go get literally anything in the deck, and is great even if you're just sacrificing a random mana dork to go get a 3-drop. We've got Pattern of Rebirth, oldie but a goodie. Uh, whenever the enchanted creature dies, you can get any creature from your battle from your library onto the battlefield. So we usually go and grab one of these big boys, Primeval Titan, our value six drop against decks like Leovold and Brea, where you're just trying to get lots of resources down quickly. You can do things like fetch Wasteland and fetch Volrath Stronghold and do some value stuff there. We've got Masker Worm to shut down Timna and Markov decks, just to kill lots of creatures quickly. Occasionally useful against something like Yisan as well. And other than that, pretty typical, lots of tutors, good cards, Grave Pact, I've been testing, I'm not sure about it, it feels a little win more sometimes, and it, the triple black's tough, but if you can get to stick, uh, your opponent had better not be planning on winning the creatures, because they're not going to. And finally, Street Wraith, uh, often seen in Modern nowadays, but rarely in Commander, uh, with Moren, it lets you put creatures into your graveyard, even if none of them have died yet, and lets you just draw an extra card every turn, it's pretty much free to add, and so it just helps the deck flow a little smoother. Anyway, let's move on to the games here. I just played a couple of leagues now with Moren. Went 4-1 in both. Uh, the deck felt really strong. It tends to get going pretty fast and, again, attacks from an angle that's just hard to stop. So let's start with this matchup against Spencer Bot. We'll probably do one league per video here. So Spencer Bot is playing Leovold. We get a very solid starting hand. Um, Mana Elf, Bitter Blossom, Removal for Leovold, Umazawa's Gite, just very flexible and strong, so love this hand. Opponent goes ahead and traverses just to hit their land drops. So a little bit of a slow start for them, and we're going to punish them. We get another Mana Elf off the top, great. Bitter Blossom's down. Bitter Blossom dies, not great. 
But now we draw a wall of roots. So the fact that it's a two mana mana elf might seem a little loose, but it has haste essentially. You can make mana immediately, which is really strong. It means I get to play Eternal Witness and get back this Bitter Blossom. Opponent's going to play Leovold, as expected. And now, I mean, we have six mana on turn four. We have all sorts of things we can do. We're going to play this Gite. Equip it to the Eternal Witness, offer the opponent the opportunity to kill the Witness and lose their Leovold. They choose not to. But even though we don't have a Revolt for this Fatal Push, which is a little annoying, it would have been nice to get a fetch land at some point, we're just going to use the Gite, kill our own Elf. We don't really need the mana that badly. And Fatal Push the Leovold. Which means that we can... Keep it off the board, make sure we don't get time twistered. Our opponent does get some card advantage, which is annoying, but because we don't have a sacrifice effect, that's pretty much what we have to do. You don't let Leovold stick around. Plus, that means their mana elves are basically useless now because we can GTA them down very easily. They play a Sylvan Library, which I don't like. That's a lot of cards, but we do have an active GTA up creature attacking, so we're going to try and reduce their life total and make this library less useful for them. Going to replay Bitter Blossom here, get down Mesmeric Fiend. Mesmeric Fiend's a great card. So. What we saw from their hand was lots of lands, two different Time Twister effects. Again, don't let Leovold stick on the board, it's a bad idea. And a Jace the Mind Sculptor, which wouldn't have been too threatening. We could kill it almost immediately with the Gite, but might as well not even let them see the cards since they already have a Sylvan Library, and that's plenty of card selection. So opponent's going to take their turn. Going to Sylvan Library, put back two cards, which I think is probably a mistake from them. Uh, they might have just been seeing lands, but even so, I think with the fetch land, you just have to... I don't know, maybe it wasn't a mistake. They are kind of under some life pressure. I think they probably played fine if they really did just see two more lands. So they're going to play a Mox Diamond and just replay Leovold, so they're threatening next turn to Time Twister and still run away with the game. And what do we hit? We hit... Cavern of Souls, not that useful. Doesn't mean we're not going to get Force Spiked, though, which I guess is fine. So we're just going to cast Moren this turn. Attack with the Eternal Witness, deal a bunch of damage. So we use two GTA counters to put him to 19. We're trying to keep his three counters in the GTA so we can kill the Leovold if they try to Time Twister, but still reduce their life total to make the Sylvan Library less useful. And the plan turns out to work pretty well, so they're going to try and cast a Time Twister. I'm not sure if they were thinking of us killing the Leovold in response. They have a Murder's Cut first, which is strong, taking out Moren. But they try for this Time Twister. I remove three counters. Give them three cards off their Leovold, which hurts, but it does mean that they can't afford to let this Time Twister resolve anymore because all their new cards will go away. So they make the clever and necessary play of Force Spiking their own Time Twister. So in summary, they spent their entire turn using two cards from their hand to draw three more cards and lose their commander, so that was not a very good turn for them. And now we just untap, hit them for a bunch more damage, draw a Reclamation Sage, which is a very good draw for us. Sage away the Sylvan Library. And consider that we could have saged away the Sylvan Library had we drawn Eldritch Evolution or Court of Calling or uh, Pattern of Rebirth. We could have done some cool stuff. So it's not like we have to just get lucky and top deck these things. We have a lot of tutoring, which is pretty nice. And now the opponent is pretty much out of options. They don't have a Sylvan Library anymore. No cards for them. They're just going to slam Leovold again. And long story short, it's not going to work. We're going to attack them for way too much damage. Oh look, Eldritch Evolution, Speak of the Devil. So now we even get to just sacrifice a Mana Dork, sacrifice our Wall of Roots, which wasn't going to attack anyway, get a Merciless Executioner, they sack their Leovold, and we have a lot of damage coming across. And that does it, and they scoop. All right, so Leovold crushed very easily with some help from Umazawa's Gite, but consider that we have a lot of weapons against Leovold. Any hand with Merciless Executioner, for example, tends to do pretty well. And let's move on to the next match here. So that was Leovold. Up and down easily enough. Now we get to play against Markov, and this is one heck of a match here. So we have a ridiculous opening hand again. Lots of fast mana, and a good semi-finisher in Acidic Slime. So with this hand we get to go turn one Finhorn Elves, turn two Wall of Roots and Smuggler's Copter, turn three Acidic Slime, and that's even if they kill the Mana Dork. And then if they have kind of a landlight hand, we're just going to crush them by sliming one of their lands. We can also slime a Skull Clamp or an Obelisk of Erd. So we're going to drop a Finhorn Elves here. They're going to get a really good first turn. They start with a Chrome Mox and a Legion's Landing. So they're going to be able to flip this Legion's Landing on turn two, which is a little unfortunate, and have a lot of lands. So, so much for the Mana Denial plan with Slime, but this is still a good hand. 
And we drew Hope of Girapur, which isn't amazing in this matchup. It's more meant to be an anti-Jace card uh, and good against other combo decks that rely on spells, but it's a thing we can play. It gets in the way of a vampire. It's fine. Easy to recur with Moren. Anyway, a quick word on Moxen. I was playing Mox Diamond in this deck until recently. I thought about adding Chrome Mox, and in the end just wound up cutting both Moxen for two lands. That might be incorrect, um, but I think there are two kinds of commander decks. Some are more speed decks, like Markov and Leovold. You really just want to play as many Moxen as possible because you're either trying to get the opponent dead immediately, or you are trying to get some kind of combo going. So Moxen are very good with Leovold when you're just going to redraw your hand anyway with a Time Twister or something like that. But Moren is more of a grind em out kind of deck. We really try to use every one of our resources to the fullest. We are more of a control deck. And so something like a Mox Diamond that gets rid of a land to give you some extra mana quickly might seem powerful, but we often don't have the card advantage to just remake that land immediately. Uh, same goes for Chrome Mox. Sometimes we really just need all the cards in our hand. It's kind of like putting together a puzzle and you can't just get rid of one piece. Now, it may be incorrect, it may be that I'm eventually going to put the Moxen back in, but so far I've been liking the version that isn't running Moxes and has a couple of extra lands instead. Anyway, on my turn, I'm just going to play the Wall of Roots and the Smuggler's Copter and the Hope of Gearper. So one nice thing is the Hope can actually crew the Copter, which means we get to block this turn. And I'm feeling pretty good about this, but my opponent does get a pretty strong turn. So they're going to go in, flip the landing. I just block... Some of their stuff, try to get the lifelink vampire off the board with Smuggler's Copter, draw, discard a mana confluence here. So I had to think for a bit, do I want the colored mana off of mana confluence, or do I want to be able to wasteland via Danto, the first fort they've got there? And I think I made a mistake, I think I kept wasteland here, but probably keeping in mind that I have no black mana, would have been better to keep the mana confluence and just cast Moran safely. So that I think was a little punt on my part, but... Thankfully, things go okay anyway. So my opponent has a Zealous Persecution. Again, this is pretty scary. Turn two, they attack with three creatures. Use Zealous Persecution. Kill my Smuggler's Copter with their Vampire Token. And kill my Finhorn Elves. So I'm suddenly going from having a lot of mana to having much less, but thankfully Wall of Roots has survived. And now it's more Vampires. Okay, so a lot of tokens here. If they have a big finisher, I might be in some trouble. But going to stay strong. We do not draw black mana there. Again, a little bit punished. I would have liked to cast Moren this turn, but instead we're just going to Wasteland, play the Slime, try and just keep their mana constrained so they don't get to play their commander, take out their vampire generating land. They have an unclaimed territory to give them access to red mana, and, but they're not getting any damage through. The Slime is a 2-2, and sometimes Markov does just get stopped by a 2-2. So we draw Sakura Tribe Elder again. No black mana, which is really annoying, but... We're just going to go ahead and Wasteland here. I want to keep them off of red mana in case they're trying to get up to Markov level. And because we're going to get black mana off Skura Tribe Elder, we can just easily enough, uh, once we have Moren in play, we tend to build up lands really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and just Wasteland, try and keep them off of casting anything too powerful. They steal Shaper's Gift and go get Skull Clamp. Gross. Okay, so now they're going to make get lots of cards in their hand. Right now, by the way, my current plan in this game it might seem like I don't have a lot going on, but... Uh, even though Primeval Titan isn't the best here, Primeval Titan still blocks very well and lets me suck lots of lands out of my deck. I can go get things like um, Volrath Stronghold to start recurring creatures. I can get creature lands, and I can get, uh, for example, Phyrexian Tower, a land that taps and sacrifices a creature to add two black. So my hope is to use Primeval Titan to set up something like Acidic Slime and Phyrexian Tower, which, combined with Moren's Recursion, can just kill all my opponent's lands. Now, whether they're going to give me time to execute on that plan, I don't think so anymore. Not with the Skull Clamp out, so now I need something else to happen. I still don't have many good attacks. We're still keeping our life total pretty high, which is important. But now they've gone back up to four cards in hand. And because we can't get rid of the Skull Clamp, things are not looking great. So we're just going to play Moren. We see Moren get back a Sakura Tribe Elder, just trying to build up lands to make it to this Primeval Titan. Opponent is going to just keep casting little vampires and clamping the vampires and so on. Drawing lots of cards. We just hit a land. So right now, Primeval Titan is no longer our primary game plan because we have drawn... Oh, never mind. We do play the Titan this turn, trying to get some lands out of the deck. Don't have Wasteland anymore, unfortunately, but we do get to get Temple of Malady, which scries into... Pattern of Rebirth, so you might not have caught it right there, but next turn you're definitely going to see it. So my opponent takes another turn with the Skull Clamp in play. I'm still worried that they're going to somehow play like a Captivating Vampire or just play their Commander and hit us really hard. 
So I'm a little worried, but instead they're just going to, you know, they think they're safe. They don't know this deck very well. They're just going to keep drawing cards, play Stoneforge Mystic and Numazawa's Jitae. They think they're just going to grind me out. Then they play Shared Animosity, which means that we're probably dead in two turns, because this is going to let all the vampires attack for enormous amounts of damage. But so far, they're a little shy to make the attack. If I were them, I probably would have attacked here. They get to attack with uh, an extra three points of power on all their vampires, which means that even though Primeval Titan eats something, they still get through for a bunch of damage. But maybe it didn't seem right. I don't know what's in their hand at the time. And they don't know what I know, which is that I am going to get to go untap. So one problem with Pattern of Rebirth is that the creature does have to die before you go get to search your library for something. But again, in this deck, it's not a problem. Look, not only can we throw down Wall of Roots and then remove the last counter from Wall of Roots so Wall of Roots just dies, we can also play Skura Tribe Elder, sacrifice Skura Tribe Elder that way, or we can put it on any creature and use Phyrexian Tower to sack it. So just with these, like, you know, 15 or so cards that we've taken out of our deck, we have three different ways to sacrifice creatures, and if we really wanted to, we could just put it on a regular creature and then our opponent can't attack anymore because the pattern of rebirth will die. So we're in pretty good shape here, I would say. And right now we're just going to play pattern of rebirth on the wall of roots. After playing Grim Harya Specs, uh, an old uh, Tarkir block favorite, whenever a creature I control dies, draw a card. Very solid. So now we get to sack wall of roots, draw a card off of the Grim Harya Specs. Now note, I stacked that, that stack was a little bit awkward because there's a chance we draw Masker Worm. But instead we draw Minister of Pain, we draw the mini Masker Worm, so even more ways to kill vampires, but yeah, an experience counter on Marin. Now we go get Massacre Worm, and their life total goes down real fast. And then they untap, they can't really, we hit them for a bunch of damage with Primeval Titan and such, they're down to 13 suddenly, and I mean last turn it looked like they were dominating and now they're just dead, they can't do anything. Are they even going to try, or are they just going to concede? Nope, they, they play a land and they, they know they're dead. We're just going to run over them with this Primeval Titan and Masker Worm, and if they play any creatures, they can't block because Masker Worm's going to deal them damage even for chump blocking, so they, I think, see the writing on the wall. And yeah, that's pretty much how Markov goes. They try to kill you pretty fast, but you're just looking for Masker Worm and Minister of Pain and finding some way to sweep everything away, even though you don't really play very many traditional sweepers. You just have Toxic Deluge. So that's the Markov game. And now we're up for the one loss of the league, a real heartbreaker here against Kix. So Kix is playing Leovold, and we are forced to mulligan into a really unpromising hand. So we have a Skull Clamp, which is not very good against Leovold, a Seder Wayfinder, and five lands now, which is really bad. Uh, they did, And they have a Mox, too, so they're going to get to play Leovold on turn two. We're not going to really get any time to get this Clamp going at all. And so this game just seems horrendous. It seems like we should just lose automatically, especially since we just drew a 6-drop. We're not going to get to use for a while, but there is hope. So they're not doing much. I think they're just, they are just—they see that we have not much going on. I think they're just going to try and use this Mikakoro to draw lots of extra cards and kind of win at their leisure. We draw Eldritch Evolution, which is exciting, except for if they have a counter, we're forced to sacrifice a creature to use the Evolution, and then we don't really want to empty our board and just run headlong into a counter spell. So instead... Are we going to try it? Are we going to try it? Yeah, we do try it. We don't have anything else to do. We use the Eldritch Evolution, and it gets remanded. Yep, so punished pretty hard there. Opponent gets to draw an extra card off their counter spell, but thankfully they're not time twistering us just yet. So we get to fire off Moren. And they don't really do a lot this game. That's the thing about Leovold is it's a powerful deck, but sometimes they're just drawing a lot of cards and not really doing very much with all those cards. So we get to play Moran, and already you can see how even if we can't draw extra cards against Leovold, Moran is drawing us an extra spell every turn by just sifting through the graveyard. So I choose to get back Seder Wayfinder, even though I had a lot of other creatures to choose from, because I don't think it's worth it to get Rexage. Killing this Mox draws them a card off of Leovold, and it's... Kind of an iffy proposition. I don't think Restraining the Mana is how I'm going to win this game. I think the way I'm going to win this game is trying to take Leovold off the board and then crush them with Primeval Titan value or something like that. So this turn, I am going to go ahead and try to get down Courser of Crufix, which is another way to draw some extra cards with a Leovold in play. You can just draw lands right off the top of your deck. Courser Resolves, no lands on top, but now I have High Market, so... Colorless land, sacrificing creature to gain one life isn't great, but it does let you get experience counters on Moren and let you rebuy your uh, comes into play abilities very easily, so that's going to be important later. 
So we just cast Seder Wayfinder again. They're just drawing extra cards. We get Phyrexian Tower. Again, getting more mana is great. Now we're getting to the point where we can cast this Primeval Titan if they ever go shields down. Nope. Days Undoing. Okay, so our hand disappears. We at least get to play a land off of this Corsair, but our opponent just drew three cards and made us discard three for three mana. And they have both of those value-generating lands in play, the Sanitarium and the Mikakoro. So we're just going to keep trying here. We do miss an attack with the Corsair of Crufix. We should have equipped the Skull Clamp to it and attacked. We could have dealt an extra three damage since they wouldn't have wanted to block. That's a mistake. But we do have access to Fauna Shaman. And we choose to play out this Deathrite Shaman now because otherwise they can use gear the Sanitarium to just make us discard it. This Sanitarium is going to keep us empty-handed as long as they keep up three mana. But the Deathrite Shaman does give us a way to deal damage to them. And so we're just going to see if we can slowly whittle them down. And here we use High Market to sacrifice the Deathrite Shaman, get an experience counter from Ren, and because of Ren's ability, we just get the Deathrite Shaman right back out of our graveyard. So we got an experience counter for free and gained a point of life. So opponent's just sitting there still. I have no idea what is in their hand. They have eight cards. But I guess if they're just full of Time Twisters and card draw, maybe they just don't see any reason to do that. Maybe it's more important for them to stop us from drawing cards. So we use Marsh Flats, find an Eldritch Evolution on top, and... We try to draw it, but they use Sanitarium and we lose it, so that's sad. But now we do remember to clamp the Courser, hit for six more damage. I mean, this is going to add up. They can't take too many more turns of this. And now we're rebuying Seder Wayfinder, which means that now I get to actually potentially put stuff in my hand. Seder Wayfinder would let me maybe get lands to protect my hand from the Sanitarium. Instead, we're just going to dump a bunch of creatures in the graveyard, but hey, now we have a Primeval Titan in there. So we have some threatening stuff we can get back if we can ever get enough experience counters. And on top of our deck, we have a Bane Whip Punisher. So this would kill the Leovold if they let us draw it. But let's see what happens. They're going to play Teferi's Puzzle Box. So now it seems like they have the complete lock. Because Teferi's Puzzle Box means that every time it's our draw step, we have to put all the cards in our hand on the bottom of our library. And because of Leovold, we don't get to draw any new ones. That's not good. But we're going to fight it out anyway. And we're almost going to win. Spoiler alert, we don't. But we're going to fight it out. So for the rest of the game, we're just attacking them with our creatures. They flash in Snapcaster Mage to kill Moren, but that means we get to do a little bit of value engineering with the Fauna Shaman. So they trade their Leovold for Moren, we just recast Moren. They're going to replay Leovold, so they're not doing a lot still. And now we actually sort of have cards in our hand, but the Teferi's Puzzle Box is going to take them away. But note this little trick, we use Fauna Shaman to discard the Bane Whip Punisher that turn before the puzzle box can shuffle it away. So now it's in our graveyard, which means the Moren, because we've been getting experience counters with this high market, gets back the Punisher, and now we get to kill their Leovold. So now their Leovold's about to die, and they're only at eight life. They're almost in trouble here. And they've been trying to figure out what to do. Their puzzle box is reshuffling their hand every turn. They play a Birds of Paradise, which isn't very good, and then we kill their Leovold, and now, well, we actually get to draw cards. We get to keep cards in our hand. And here's where I make a mistake that I think might be kind of costly. So. I am declining to use this Wasteland here, but I probably should have tried to use it, just because it, though it may seem like they have basically endless mana, there are still, you know, we don't want them to have unlimited ability to play spells. If I'm going to use this Wasteland post-combat, might as well not let them get value off it with something like a Cryptic Command. Anyway, it turns out to be a small thing, so we're going to sacrifice our Corsair Crufix, draw some extra cards. And so this is tricky, because I'm almost certain they have a counter spell going on. But now we've drawn discard. So now, if we had taken out a land pre-combat, that's one fewer land they could use to do something like counter this discard spell, or after the discard spell, counter the Diabolic Intent. So we're going to play Inquisition of Kozilek, and we're going to look at their hand. And in response, they're going to kill my Moren, which means we don't get to get back any value cards. That's not great. But they're at six life. We both have death rate shamans, but they're at six life. Maybe we can get them. We do get a Time Twister out of their hand, but unfortunately, they finally use the puzzle box to get Emrakul out. Now they're going to do something really smart. So we could try to use Diabolic Intent. They would counter it with Cryptic Command. So that wouldn't work very well. I probably should have used it anyway because I'm thinking that Emrakul is going to get shuffled back with the puzzle box. So I don't think I'm going to get Emrakul next turn. And if they do Emrakul me, of course, with this Diabolic Intent, they can tutor up my Toxic Deluge and make me pay my entire life total. So I'll lose. But instead, they're very smart. They uh, use Cryptic Command here to bounce their own Teferi's Puzzle Box, so they get to keep this Ember Cool in their hand, and then they kill me. So this was a game I had no business winning, but see how it was very close, just because Moran is such a good value engine 
out of the graveyard and now they're gonna they do exactly that they use worldly tutor to make sure that i have a toxic deluge they can use and then they tutor it up with diabolic intent and kill me but it was close i think if i had wastelanded pre-combat gotten their cryptic command so they couldn't cast it that turn we might have actually stood a chance Anyway, moving on to the last two wins of the league, which were much simpler and cleaner games. We run up against JX Claytor. And they are running. Let's see what it was. Looks to be. Alright, so we're on the play. We have a hand that's a little awkward because our opponent is playing a zombie Lady of Scrolls, which might seem like a weird blue commander. It's it's not Jace, what's going on, but. I played against this in a recent commander challenge, and it can be really dangerous. They just play a few wizards, and suddenly, if you are... If they're able to even resolve a zombie, they just get to draw four cards, which is very bad, because they're also playing the usual high tide, blue, big mana combo cards. So they can kind of win out of nowhere, or grind you out. It's tough. But notice how we have this Grave Pact, and if we resolve this, they're going to have a hard time stockpiling wizards. Anyway. So they just have an island, and now we draw Birthing Pod. At this point, the game is basically over if this card resolves. Birthing Pod just gives us so much flexibility in terms of answering whatever threats our opponent tries to pose, and it's bonkers with Grave Pact. So, we're going to try it. We hope we don't get Force Spiked or Spell Pierced, and we did not get Spell Pierced or Force Spiked. We resolved a Birthing Pod. And this is the downside of the Azami deck, is you have to play Wizards. Seeker of Insight, it's like a Merfolk Looter, but a Wizard, so fine, I guess, but it's no Jace Rin's Prodigy. So this turn, we are just going to... We could play Moran, but again, there's nothing in our graveyard. It's not really a good value engine. So instead, I'm just going to make sure we resolve this Grave Pact, which, as an enchantment, is pretty hard for these blue decks to get off the table. And it means that the Seeker of Insight's going to die almost immediately, so our opponent's never going to be able to get kind of a critical mass of wizards to use with the zombie. So they go for Snap to take our elves off the board. They're trying to stall us as much as possible, and then they Fabricate to go get Extra Planar Lens. So they're hoping we can't... Uh, kill this artifact. This is going to give them a ton of mana if they can exile an island with it. But because of Birthing Pod, it's just not going to work at all. So we have this Fatal Push that's not going to do much with Grave Pack, but that's okay. We play we, our Dryad Arbor Land for the turn. Another thing we can sack to Birthing Pod if need be. Play the Elves. Sack the Elves. They lose their Wizard to the Grave Pact. Keep in mind this is turn 4 and our opponent is just completely locked out of the game and we're not even playing Leobold. So we just get Devoted Druid. I just want mana at this point. Mana's good can add two mana next turn and then get sacrificed to Birthing Pod to go get something else. Our opponent, as I expected, plays the extra planar lens. So they have two blue mana up right now. So in this case, before we play our commander, we want to make sure that they can't hold up two mana to counter it. So in our pre-combat main phase, we're going to sacrifice the Devoted Druid after adding two mana. Go and get Reclamation Sage, which has been good enough that I'm almost thinking of adding Manglehorn to the deck, but for now, probably just one as a tutor target is enough. So Reclamation Sage comes down, we floated some mana, we get to play Moren, then we play Phyrexian Tower, which lets us sacrifice this Dryad Arbor, which is already tapped, and get down Tireless Tracker, and get an Experience Counter on Moren. And, because of that Experience Counter, we get back our Elf, so... As you can tell by our opponent's board and our board, we are way, way, way ahead here, and there is just no real coming back from that. They try. They are going to play it out for a few more turns. We are just kind of attacking them freely. We go and fetch Titania. Or do we? What do we get? We get Acidic Slime off of the Birthing Pod here, sacrificing Moren to just start taking out their lands, and our opponent realizes that uh, they just can't take it from here, so they're going to gonna die to this Acidic Slime value engine. Uh, by the way, Recurring Acidic Slime is one of the most common ways that we can actually beat these control decks. We have a hard time attacking the hand, or and taxing the mana is often difficult, but Acidic Slime, a card I wasn't sure about including at first, has turned out to be one of the best cards in the deck. It's just so flexible in what it can kill, and it will eventually just kind of one-side our Armageddon, our blue opponent here. They can't stop the Birthing Pod. So they scoop it up. Easy enough victory over a blue deck. And now, finally, we are up against Slax. So three and one going into this game, three pretty easy wins and one really hard fought loss. Well, no, the wins weren't all easy, that's an overstatement. But again, we're going first, so again, this league we were a little lucky, we got to be on the play a lot, and that certainly helps. And we're up against Jace Friend's Prodigy, so a little scarier than a zombie, I think. It doesn't rely as much on creatures and can kind of combo kill you out of nowhere. 
so we have an early tireless tracker which is medium against this deck uh, it's nice to draw cards but we it doesn't really just do anything to disrupt them which is important but we do get an umbus that was jite which is really nice it means we get to kill their jace this turn and start generating clues our opponent doesn't have much to do this turn so we are kind of whacking them with this tireless tracker and now it's always a challenge of do you sacrifice clues or do you put mana into getting creatures down so I'm at least going to play this Wall of Roots. The nice thing about Wall of Roots is because it generates mana on mine and my opponent's turn, it's really good at sacrificing clues. It can help us sacrifice on both turns. We can make use of that extra mana. So we may have made a small mistake here by not sacrificing the clue earlier. Uh, I'm not sure what we're expecting our opponent to do here, but I guess in case they bounce the tracker, I wanted to have mana to replay it. So I'm not sure about that. So we have two more counters in the GTA, meaning that if they ever play Jace again, we can just kill it. So that's why GTA isn't useless against these blue decks. It's really good at killing their commander. And now we're just going to Wall of Roots. They're not going to counter that. And instead of playing Moran, we're actually just going to start sacrificing clues. Uh, we don't want them to be able to use their mana on a counter spell this turn. And we'd rather just draw some cards and see if we can find some hand disruption. So they do get to do a bit of card selecting here as a result of that. But I think probably not running Moran into a counter spell is still best, since we have this other stuff we can sink our mana into. So now they're going to cast Jace the Mind Sculptor, get rid of the Tireless Tracker. That's a little ugly, because now we have nothing to attack the Jace with. So maybe punished by not playing the Moran, I'm not sure. But we do get to crack a clue here, thanks to Wall of Roots. And now we draw Acidic Slime, MVP. And so because of Wall of Roots and because of Wild Growth, we've just quietly been accumulating mana. Which means we get to play Acidic Slime this turn, take out an island, reduce their mana, and play Smuggler's Copter, which means that... Basically, no matter what they do, we have this creature that can attack their Jace next turn. Even if they had something like a uh, Cryptic Command, we can kind of slip through, and that's just excellent. So they are going to get to Jace a little bit. They get to do some brainstorming. And they play Chromox and just sit there. So uh, they have five mana untapped. They didn't do anything. This feels like a Mystic Confluence or a Cryptic Command. But we're going to try our best to fight through it. So we are just going to play the Tireless Tracker, holding up enough mana that they'd have to confluence us with two different mana leaks. Keep generating clues and go after the Jace. Is this going to work? Let's see. So if our opponent bounces both of these creatures, we're sort of in trouble, but that also leaves us mana to Eldritch Evolution, which gives us all kinds of options for disrupting them. Uh, I wish I still had Phyrexian Revoker in the deck for situations like this. I took it out at some point. But pretty uneventful turn. We actually just get to kill the Jace. This Copter loots away our Bane Whip Punisher, but then we play Moran and get it back anyway. So our opponent just chooses to Factor Fiction this turn. The uh, split was Intuition, Island, Island, Candelabra of Thanos, and Ugin. I chose not to give them the Intuition because that tends to set up High Tide really effectively. Instead, I might have made a mistake. Maybe I should have given them both Islands in Intuition versus Ugin and Candelabra. They just go ahead and take the, the Dragon and the Artifact. So if they have High Tide, they can just Ugin me this turn. But we can even survive an Ugin thanks to Smuggler's Copter, so we're not completely doomed here. So instead our opponent has Teferi Temporal Archmage, ouch. They untap four lands, and that means, I have a feeling, it's Cryptic Command time, because I don't think they just leave their Teferi open like that if they could help it. But, well, we're going to try. We do get to sack a clue again. Look, Wall of Roots has drawn us two cards this game, essentially, thanks to this Tireless Tracker. So we're kind of firing on all cylinders. But let's see what we can do. Ooh, we drew Sidisi. That's very good. So more all-purpose tutoring means we can potentially strip the Ugin from their hand and... As I expected, they do exactly what I thought they were going to do. They Cryptic Command, tap all my creatures, bounce my Copter. So I don't get to attack the Fairy, and they're going to untap with it. But if they have a lot of mana, they have to actually have something they can do with it. And because of Sidisi, we're not going to let them do that. We're just going to play the Sidisi, sacrifice the Acidic Slime, putting in the graveyard so we can rebuy it with Moran and start killing all their lands. And while we would maybe get a Phyrexian Revoker if we had one, we're just going to get a Duress, keep it simple. Replay the Smuggler's Copter and take the Ugin out of their hand. So at this point, we've revealed that they have a Misty Rainforest, a Candelabra of Tanos, an Impulse, and a Mystic Confluence. And so they have, uh, or sorry, um, just Impulse, Candelabra, Misty Rainforest, and I think an Island. So they're untapping without much, but these decks can do a lot with a little. They're going to play Impulse to start out with. And let's see if they hit an extra turn spell or something off of that. What happened? Okay. 
So they're just going to play the Candelabra this turn and plus to Fairy. And it looks like we're finally going to, to kill this Planeswalker, except for... Mm, let's see, I think they may have played an extra turn spell this turn. I'm not sure that we got... Yeah, they played an extra turn spell. It looks like it... Ah, okay, it was Temporal Trespass, so it got exiled. So they get to take another turn with Teferi just sitting there. And it, they play a deep analysis. Don't do much else. We try to resolve this Acidic Slime. And long story short, they use Mystic Confluence. Knock out a lot of my stuff. But, ah, looks like I skipped through the turn here a little bit. The thing I did at the end was I finally got to cast this Eldritch Evolution, used it to go get Mesmeric Fiend, and then Mesmeric Fiend took out their Time Twister. So even though it's a little two drop, it's still a really good tutor target to have access to. But I did make a mistake. The thing I should have done last turn was, in response to the Mesmeric Fiend entering the battlefield, I should have killed it with my own Jite. That would have meant that the card just got exiled from my opponent's hand and they couldn't get it back. Which is a weird thing, as Mirak Fiend does not work like uh, Fairgrounds Warden, for example, or Hostage Taker. It just exiles the card as a separate ability from leaving the battlefield. So that's a fun little trick, is if you can sacrifice your Mesmeric Fiend in response to its Enter the Battlefield ability, you just get to take out the card. So I should have done that. Instead, I leave them with just a Thought Scour and Lands in hand. But they're going to do some scary rebuilding here. So they're going to top deck a Sleight of Hand, then play Thought Scour. Then use Teferi, they've drawn, they've seen th four new cards this turn, I think. And then they're going to play Walk the Aeons with Buyback. So they're in a little bit of desperation mode. They're just trying to take these extra turns and see if they can grab a Time Spiral or something like that. So still scary. And here they get to replay their Commander and use Teferi. So they're going to try and have both Jace and an extra turn spell, which lets them flip the Jace and would be game over. Except for these two counters we got from Uzo's Jite, what feels like 17 turns ago. No commander for you. So they use the extra turn spell. And now they have to start digging. So they do get to take one more turn. It's that horrible suspense that happens when you play against these blue commander decks. They get down extra planner lens, which combined with Candelabra of Thanos means they have access to 8 mana right now. That's really scary. What are they going to do with all that mana? Well, they play... One more land, and it looks like we actually get to take a turn. Oh man. So the card I'm scared of right now is like Cyclonic Rift. Which... Okay, what is going on here? So this turn they... Ah, uh, they just replay their commander again. Okay, so it looks like no Cyclonic Rift, but... If we let them untap, they get to have Jace and a lot of extra turn spells in the graveyard, which can be bad, but thankfully at this point, we've sort of run them ragged, forced them to be top decking a lot, and they're sort of out of resources. So we draw Catacomb Sifter. Catacomb Sifter is pretty good here. It means we get to do some scrying, and it means we get to sacrifice an extra creature. Notice right now we have three experience counters. Once we get to five experience counters, we can bring back Acidic Slime every turn. Bringing back Acidic Slime for every turn against this board is going to be a good thing. But first, we need to get through this Jace and kill Teferi. So the way we're going to do that... We're going to cast Catacomb Sifter. Get that experience counter. See what we have on the scry? Because we have all these clues, we can draw cards, and it's Thoughtseize. Perfect. All right, so now we're going to draw Thoughtseize, cast Thoughtseize. Our opponent had a Mana Leak, so we're going to get rid of that. Then we get to cast Bane Whip Punisher. Good old Bane Whip Punisher. <laughs> Constructed All-Star Bane Whip Punisher. Going to kill this Jace, and then we get to kill Teferi. And then at the end of the turn, we're going to bring back Acidic Slime and kill the extra Planar Lens. And yeah, in short, our opponent's going to untap with 7 mana and just no board at all and only lands in hand. I think they probably shouldn't have scooped here. I think they probably should have tried to draw Time Spiral, but yeah, if they don't draw Time Spiral, they're dead. They're just dead. So great game, and we just crushed this blue control deck. So it's a matchup that's often iffy, but I think I've learned to adapt a little bit. Basically, you just want to get Mesmeric Fiend whenever you can and start doing tricks with it and pressure their mana at the same time. So that was a league, and uh, thanks for watching. I'll probably record this other league, this other 4-1 at some point, but that's long enough for one video. Thanks for sticking with it, and leave a comment if you'd like to see more like this. I do like playing rogue decks, and I love puzzling out different lines, and I hope it's all comprehensible. I want these videos to actually be at a point where you can understand what's going on, so any comments are much appreciated. Thanks again for watching, and I'll uh, see you in other videos, I hope.